only mode. So we're live. All right, let's let's get started. Hi everyone, my name's John Davis. I'm project supervisor for OpenChannels.org, the online forum on ocean planning. Also with me is Nick Weiner, project manager for Open Channels. He's handling the technical side of this webinar. For more information, go to www.openchannels.org. Mare is co-presenting this webinar with the EBM Tools Network, an alliance of leading tool users, developers, and training providers in ecosystem-based management. You may hear the voice of Sarah Carr at some point uh, in this webinar. She's coordinator of the EBM Tools Network. Um, their website is www.ebmtools.org. Existing studies have helped define what good ocean planning or marine or maritime spatial planning looks like as well as the potential conservation of community benefits and how it theoretically could cut costs and create economic value. However, uh, up to this point, relatively little evidence has been compiled uh, to show the actual results of ocean plans that are in place. Today's webinar will give you a preview of the results of a new study of the economic, environmental, and social impacts of five established ocean plans, the U.S. state of Massachusetts, the U.S. state of Rhode Island, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, Norway's Barents Sea, and Belgium. Uh, this webinar will walk you through the detailed results, including the benefits and costs of these ocean plans. Uh, this is how the webinar will work. Our two presenters, Jason Blau and Lee Green of Redstone Strategy Group, who I'll describe in a bit more detail in a, in a minute, will together provide a 20-minute PowerPoint, and the audience will see each speaker's presentation on your own computer screen. Then we will open the floor to questions from you, the audience, for the remainder of the hour. We'll conclude the webinar about an hour from now. If you have a question for our presenters, you can submit it in the question box that is on the control panel on your screen, the webinar control uh, panel. Uh, we'll be drawing from those questions throughout the question and answer session. So uh, let's, let's uh, start this up. Uh, Lee Green is a principal at Redstone Strategy Group and leads the firm's Colorado office. He's helped dozens of foundations and NGOs over the last 10 years on topics ranging from conservation to climate and energy to health and education. He has worked on U.S. fisheries and marine conservation in addition to co-authoring this report on ocean planning. Jason Blau is a project manager at Redstone Strategy Group. He's worked extensively on economic development and environmental policy projects, including on U.S. fisheries, indigenous lands, and conservation in the American West. In this capacity, he has authored studies on the environmental, economic, social, and budgetary impacts of transitioning fisheries to cash shares management, and is a co-author of this report on ocean planning. Here are Lee Green and Jason Blau. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. This is Lee. Um, I'll just give you the, the two-sentence description of Redstone and then hand it over to Jason to, to walk through the results of this particular work. Um, so just for those of you who don't know, Redstone Strategy Group is a consulting firm um, with offices in Colorado and San Francisco, um, and we work exclusively in the social sector. Uh, so we work with foundations and nonprofits on strategic planning, business planning, evaluations, uh, and answering research questions such as this one. Great. So this is Jason here, and I'll, I'll walk through our, our preliminary results. I just want to start by saying uh, thanks to uh, John, Nick, and Sarah for getting this all organized and for all of you for joining us today. recognize a lot of names on the attendees list who have been a part of this work in one way or another, and so just really appreciate everyone's help and interest. Uh, so as John said, you know, our, our goal here was to take a retrospective look where ocean planning has happened to try to determine what the concrete economic, environmental, and social impacts of it have been. So the way we did that, uh, and this slide should load shortly, is to look in depth at five case studies, two in the United States, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, two in Europe, Norway and Belgium, then in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef. 
to go in depth into these five plans to get a sense of the diverse geographies of where ocean planning has happened uh, for the plans that have been in, in place for a few years. We actually have some data to look at and that are broadly considered to be good representative ocean plans. Uh, we did also try to pull in data from other plans where we could, uh, specifically the United Kingdom, Germany, and the Netherlands, uh, all in Northern Europe, uh, to try to be as comprehensive as possible. Uh, with each case study, uh, that was a combination of research, analysis, and then also visits uh, to each of those places to meet with stakeholders and get their sense of the situation. So let's start by talking about the economic impacts of ocean planning. And what we've seen is that the biggest gains go to uh, wind farms as far as new economic activity goes. At the same time, ocean planning also uh, maintained the economic value of incumbent industries. So these things weren't necessarily coming at a loss to other stakeholders, which is really important given the over $4 billion in ocean economies just within the case studies we looked at. So let's walk you through each of these in a bit more detail. Uh, as mentioned, the biggest gains when we talk about you know, concrete, you know, who is made, who has seen real economic value uh, on top of what they've seen before, that was the new users, that was the wind farms. And the basic reason why we saw that in these case studies is that one of the main challenges ocean planning helps to overcome is this idea that we're going to move from a situation where uh, things just are the way they are to a better planned and more rational allocation of ocean space and use. And so wind farms, which are not the incumbent users, tend to benefit because now there is space carved out for them. And that was certainly true in Belgium and Rhode Island. Uh, in Belgium, previous attempts to the, 2000, the original 2004 plan to site wind were unsuccessful. They ran into too many not-in-my-backyard issues. Uh, after the marine, after the ocean plan was able to set aside a bit of the ocean space, they saw over 700 megawatts uh, in development or planned of, of offshore wind. Rhode Island, that's similar. Uh, the first successful federal offshore wind lease is just off the state waters of Rhode Island, part of the Rhode Island ocean plan. Uh, and so that was, you know, when you think of that in contrast to Cape Wind, an example many of you may be familiar with, uh, in Massachusetts, which you know, I think we're at 15 years now and it still hasn't happened, you know, this is what we're saying, this is what we expect to see and do see out of ocean plants, that they're able to make space for wind farms and that has major economic benefits. Uh, briefly on Massachusetts, uh, the, there was no offshore wind in Massachusetts. There was one undersea cable project uh, from the mainland of Massachusetts to Martha's Vineyard. And we do estimate economic benefits to the cable developers in the hundreds of thousands of dollars due to the more efficient process that uh, the ocean plan created. Uh, we did not see similar benefits in Norway and the Great Barrier Reef uh, because no new industry came into the fore. In addition to new industries, we also wanted to look at incumbent industries. And what we found is that on the whole, plans did retain the vast majority of the economic value of incumbent industries, uh, totaling into the billions of dollars uh, every year. Uh, the largest of these was the Great Barrier Reef with its large tourism industry. Uh, there are estimates that you know, with degradation of the reef, the tourism industry could be cut as much as half uh, and out of a six billion dollar a year industry with a few billion in profits every year, that's a major impact on the Australian economy. By implementing an ocean plan and preserving the areas, that's a major benefit. Uh, fishing was then dominant, it was important in the Great Barrier Reef, more dominant in the other plans, uh, and on the whole, those values were retained as well. I'll talk a bit for a second about where we saw some particular economic losses, and those were generally concentrated in the fishing sector. And what we saw was that there were losses. Uh, they were generally minor relative to the overall value of the plan, and that in general, plans compensated fishermen for their losses that the plan could be uh, counted for. So for example, in Australia, where there was a significant increase in no-take areas, uh, the government set aside $210 million uh, for everything from lost profit to retraining 
the business uh, consulting and services for the incumbent fishing industry, uh, independent analyses of fishermen's losses due to that increase in no-take areas put it in the $10 million range. So you know, to the extent that there were losses, it seems pretty clear that the government compensated, if not overcompensated, for them. Uh, in Rhode Island, the story was different. It was not that there were new MPAs or no-take areas. It's that the wind farm takes up space in the ocean, and during construction, fishermen would not have access to those areas. At the same time, out of the plan, we saw uh, $0.3 million or $300,000 of compensation for fishermen uh, just for a small five-turbine uh, wind farm off of Block Island. Much more compensation is likely for the larger uh, federal lease wind farm further offshore. And again, those compensation packages uh, appear to be consistent, if not greater than, the losses the fishermen are likely to, to see. The Netherlands did things slightly different. As wind farms expanded, the government uh, established a fund to compensate fishermen. They did it, though, with the caveat that the funds would only be released to fishermen fishing in stocks that were not currently strained and overfished. As of yet, uh, no one has been able to claim that money because most of the stocks are overfished. Uh, so you know, we do think it's true that there are Certain industries, particularly fishermen, see some losses from ocean planning. At the same time, one of the advantages of planning is it allows you to see what those losses are and compensate actors accordingly. We asked one additional question on the economic impacts of ocean planning, and that is what happens to government spending. And what we found, and this was true across plans, is that government spending basically breaks even. On the one hand, agencies, uh, when doing the plan, they spend more on stakeholder outreach, they do a bit of research to fill in data gaps, and they also increase their collaboration both within the government and with external stakeholders, which has a time and, and money cost to it. Uh, however, they also spend less on appeals and litigation because all of that stakeholder outreach and quality data has been collected beforehand. So that saves them from being dragged through years of, of litigation, particularly in the more litigious North America. Uh, so in all of our case studies, you know, we did see you know, some possibility of costs and some possibility of benefits, but on the whole, uh, there was no significant change in government spending. So let's turn now to the environmental side of things. And we saw a few different kinds of environmental impacts from ocean planning. First and foremost, it definitely expanded protection of the area of the plans, up to 50% on average. It also cuts carbon by providing for the siting of the wind farms we described. And then there were also many smaller examples of managing industrial growth so that uh, strong economies and strong environmental protection can coexist. So I'll walk through each of those now. When we just think about you know, what percent of the plan of the area under planning is being protected, we did see a major increase due to the ocean plans. You know, on the order of up to 50 percent on average from a base of around 11 percent. The majority of this is a sub MPA, sub IUCN level of protection that we have at the top called light. And in these areas we're saying there's no new industrial use. Uh, so for example, Massachusetts you know, did not declare any MPAs but over 70% of Massachusetts state waters are extremely unlikely to see new wind farm development, natural gas terminals, uh, things of that like. Uh, we did also see IUCN level protections uh, largely in the Great Barrier Reef, since that was a, a strong management objective, uh, both the lower and higher, more strict actual no-take areas. As mentioned, the environmental impacts of ocean planning uh, went beyond just the, the spatial protection. You know, I think we have to see offshore wind as a major environmental benefit by taking carbon, uh, by, by, by replacing more carbon-intensive forms of energy production. You know, these offshore wind plants were not happening without ocean plans. And the example on the left, I'm just south of uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and the federal waters there. Uh, that were included in the Rhode Island Ocean Plan, 
and I think that that shows this well. Uh, in the the dark, and sorry, in the in the light green, you'll see there was this original block, this area of mutual interest of where a wind farm could go. But slicing through that bottom third of that was Cox's Ledge, one of the most productive spawning grounds of the area, very important to fishermen, very important to conservationists. And with marine with ocean planning. Uh, the planners were able to bring everyone together, recognize how important that was, and then optimize the siting of the wind farm around it. Right? So you can see those areas were removed from the area of mutual interest into what became the wind lease area specifically because of that. At the same time, it also ensures fair compensation uh, since there now is good data on what, where fishermen are, how valuable that territory is, which then smooths relationships between fishermen and the wind developers. The result for the environment is over one gigawatt of renewable energy, uh, over two-thirds of that uh, in Belgium and probably a 300 to 400 megawatts uh, in this lease here. Uh, so a, a big victory for uh, renewable energy. Finally, when we talk about managing industrial growth, shipping lanes were a, a common topic of conversation uh, specifically in Norway and Australia. It's quite hard to get a ship through the Great Barrier Reef successfully. I'd like to focus on Norway for a second, uh, where the shipping lane, they, the ocean plan resulted in a lot of data on where the best place to move the shipping lane would be. The Norwegian government then petitioned the IMO to move the shipping lane further offshore and also separate northbound and southbound traffic. The result of that uh, is that they've modeled out, they're estimating a 20% drop in accidents since ships are uh, in their own lanes and less likely to conflict with coastal traffic, a 30% drop in oil spill volumes, uh, not only through the reduction in, in accident possibility, but also since ships are further offshore, that gives responders more time to get to the ship before it runs aground. And finally, a 40% drop in collisions with fishing vessels the fishing vessels are mostly near to the shore, and by moving the shipping lane further out, we're reducing that conflict between the two industries. So I think this example shows nicely you know, how ocean planning can provide win-win uh, solutions between industries, also helping conservation. You know, in this particular example, uh, the IMO estimated that the fuel usage would not increase at all and perhaps decrease uh, based on the, the shipping lane switch, so it was not even difficult to persuade the shipping industry that this was a good idea. So I'll close by describing a few of the social benefits we've seen, uh, sorry, the social impacts we've seen, and you know, these are tougher to quantify, uh, but I think no less important, particularly as we try to think about the long-term impacts of ocean planning and how it can build uh, a more collaborative culture in ocean management. So I'll just discuss a few of the stakeholders we saw to be most involved in ocean planning uh, and benefiting from this collaboration and further research. Uh, so fishermen engage not only in the ocean plan itself but in broader planning processes. And we see that in uh, Massachusetts, where the fishermen organization is now more at the table than they were before. They can see what kind of developments are coming up in the future and they can respond to that. We see developers uh, in a stance of cooperation. They're negotiating with conservation groups, with fishermen. They're modifying plans in response to concerns and they're compensating folks a reasonable amount for their impact. You know, contrast this with developers that only that whose natural position would be uh, just to get the approval they need and then litigate from then on. Uh, next, native tribes owning their part in marine management. We saw this heavily in the United States and Australia. Tribes were consulted as part of the ocean planning process. And then in Australia, going so far as actually jointly managing parts of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park uh, in accordance with agreements with the relevant authorities. Uh, finally, governments benefiting uh, from the expanded cooperation both within and outside of government, and then also increasing research funding, which should lead to better ocean management in the future. Uh, a common theme we heard when talking to agency folks was that upon starting the ocean planning process, they realized that there were actually some key data gaps that 
they should really have the answers to, and they didn't. And so there was both some research funding throughout, through the plan, and in some cases, particularly in Norway, increasing commitment to ocean research coming up with the plan. So that's our, our brief summary of at least the early results of our project. Uh, you know, seeing pretty strong economic gains, particularly in the wind industry, maintaining economic values elsewhere, and handling the times where there are economic losses, environmental protection increasing significantly, particularly in Australia, also the carbon benefits of expanded offshore wind development, and finally the greater collaboration and research that's come through these plans and should pay dividends down the road. Uh, happy to take questions that John has been able to collect. We also have our email addresses on the top of your screen and you should feel free to be in touch. Uh, with that, thanks so much for your attention and we look forward to discussing. Thanks a lot, uh, Jason and Lee. Um, as, as you just mentioned, we now open up the webinar to the audience for the next uh, about 40 minutes. Um, if you have a question for our presenters, you can submit it in the question box. That is on the GoToWebinar control panel on your computer screen. Uh, we'll be drawing from those questions throughout this Q&A session. Uh, we already have uh, several questions coming in. Um, my first question to you, Jason and Lee, is um, uh, how do you anticipate uh, disseminating your results uh, in case people would like to, to read through the report uh, in detail? Great, thanks. Uh, we're currently pursuing academic publication of at least a summary of these results. So uh, as soon as we know whether that is going to happen, we'd be happy to uh, send out links to the relevant publication. Because of that, we can't distribute, uh, we can't pre-publish the results since it's in the, the peer review process. Uh, but we'd be happy to keep folks apprised as things develop. Excellent, thanks. Uh, we had a question. Uh, regarding uh, expanded ocean protection. The question is, what is the percentage of expanded ocean protection uh, if you take the Great Barrier Reef out of your calculations? Uh, great question. Uh, I'm going to just look through my data here. You know, the Great Barrier Reef did grant the largest IUCN level protection. At the same time, we did see higher levels of protection uh, of the industrial management variety, uh, particularly in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And Massachusetts, uh, working from a base of uh, just under 10%, now nearly 80% of the state waters are, for most intents and purposes, closed to industrial development. In Rhode Island, it was over half the ocean plan area uh, was you know, not fully, but for most practical purposes, closed to industrial development. Uh, Belgium and Norway, the protection itself was smaller, but there's a subtlety there, uh, which is that in Norway, the major policy question at the time in the Barents Sea was whether oil drilling would expand into the Lofoten Island area. The plan eventually resulted in that area, at least for now, being maintained close to further oil, sorry, to new oil and gas development. So, you know, we would not say the percent of the Barents Sea had in, in protection had increased. At the same time, uh, conservationists dodged a, a pretty major development into a sensitive area. All right, thanks. Uh, we have a question on impacts to cetaceans. I'd like to know if impacts to cetaceans were taken into account in terms of noise from wind farms and from the example of moving shipping lanes. Uh, I'm sorry, John, I had a, a tough time hearing. Impacts to? So I'd like to know if impacts to cetaceans were taken into account in your study, uh, such as in terms of noise from wind farms or um, as pertaining to the example you had of moving shipping lanes? Uh, it, so if we understand the question correctly, and, and apologies to the questionnaire if we don't, and, and feel free to follow up over email. Uh, in general, no, but not because uh, we ignored them from the start, but because in our discussions with stakeholders and our review of the relevant literature, 
those were not expected to be significant impacts. Uh, you know, one study that comes to mind is from Rhode Island where you know, there was a big question as to whether the wind farms were going to cause trouble for birds, and it turned out the answer was you know, not significant no more so than any other wind farm and not significant to the species under consideration. So it was more of a, an analytical triage than anything else. Uh, but apologies if we didn't understand the question correctly. All right, thanks. Uh, what factors did you consider in choosing these five ocean plans to focus on? And did you see similar results in other ocean planning projects through your research? Great question. Uh, so we started uh, thanks to, to Bud Ehler with a, the list of every ocean plan either being implemented in development uh, that, that he was aware of. We refined that by speaking with a few other folks. We then wanted to focus down on which are the plans that have been in place you know, with government regulatory force for at least a few years so that we could say what the actual impacts have been as opposed to uh, prospective estimates of what the impacts were. Uh, that narrowed the list down to somewhere in the 15 to 20 range. Uh, we then excluded a dozen or so plans uh, from China, uh, since our particular task was to look at uh, lessons that might be relevant for a North American context. And just since uh, the governance context in China is so different from the rest of the democracies and social democracies around the world, uh, we didn't see those as particularly fruitful case studies. Uh, within then the remaining uh, 10 or dozen or so, uh, we interviewed experts in ocean planning to get their sense of where data was going to be most available and which plan best represented what an ocean plan should look like. And so that narrowed down to these five. At the same time, we did want to make sure we weren't missing major lessons from other plans and that that's why we then looked at those other European plans. Uh, there were no other major ones in the United States or in Australia. Uh, we did find consistencies uh, with between the case study plans and then those extra ones we surveyed. I would say particularly from the European examples to the other European examples, uh, just based on the social norms of the places, uh, folks tended to be much more deferential to government planning in a way that is not true in the United States. So there was generally uh, planning proceeded faster, uh, less expense. At the same time, it didn't result in significant changes in many cases in the way that it did in the United States. So I would say the consistencies were strongest between their geographic neighbors. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question, was any of the information used for your analyses collected through the planning processes? Uh, are there key types of data that should be collected through planning processes elsewhere that would enable additional comparative analyses. So in other words, can, can uh, planners anticipate um, the need for certain data to allow this type of analysis on the back end of their planning processes? Ah, that's a great question. We would, we would love for that to be true. Uh, you know, our sense of these plans is that not all, because these are kind of the pioneering plans, there was less uh, thinking as to you know, what might be useful down the road. Uh, but I think you know, to the extent folks are able to collect conservate ecological and socioeconomic data ahead of time so that there's a reasonable baseline, you know, that would make this kind of analysis much easier. At the same time, you know, I, I think we all know that you know, one change in a vast, you know, long-lasting ecological system it's really hard to trace back you know, there are more sea turtles due to this particular management change. Um, so there's, there's always that caveat, but that kind of baseline data I think would be quite valuable to folks as they then try to evaluate their own plans against what they sought to accomplish. Yeah, so just to add to that, one of the, one of the uh, areas where we really would have liked to get more information was really I think a lot of the outcomes that the plans were hoping to achieve. So from an environmental perspective, you know, what, what we were able to collect was the amount of uh, protection that increased. What we weren't able to get, as Jason was saying, is what the actual 
implications have been for the environment and, and ultimately that's the data that would that would be much more powerful um, to understand what the impacts of ocean planning have been. Thanks, Lee. That's great. Thanks, guys. Uh, we had a, a quick question. Who funded this research? I, I know the Moore Foundation was a funder. Were there other funders? No, just the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation. Okay. Uh, another question. What what gaps in economic data collection did you encounter as you were conducting your research? What recommendations do you have for how best to improve governmental tracking of economic costs and benefits of marine planning as these efforts get underway, um, such as in the U.S. at the regional level? Uh, great. So, and there was, there was some of this data that we were able to piece together, particularly in Rhode Island, thanks to the, the folks at the University of Rhode Island. Um, you know, from the, the broader socioeconomic perspective, you know, having a good sense of the value add of particular industries, particularly fishing and wind, so that you can then estimate, uh, based on what you see ongoing, how those industries are changing. It's always then a question of to what extent that ties back to the ocean plan. But I think at least with strong data, as Lee said, on the implications, so, you know, what uh, the overall profitability of the fishery, uh, the overall economic productivity of the fishery or the economic impacts of a wind farm, all that kind of data would help governments explain the overall changes. Uh, I will say briefly just on the government side, uh, we did not find uh, a government agency that had you know, really carefully tracked what they were uh, spending on putting the plan together and then managing the ocean on an ongoing basis. I think that kind of data could be useful. At the same time, it seems like the answer to that might be you know, relatively ambiguous regardless. Okay, thanks. Uh, what kind of mechanisms were put in place to encourage stakeholder engagement and buy-in to the marine planning processes in these case studies? Uh, did you see any consistency at all between the five sites along this line? Uh, yeah, so there's, there's there is a base level of consistency, which is, you know, all of the plans involve you know, really conscientious outreach to different stakeholders. And then I would say the main difference is then what that actually looks like in practice. So in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, you know, that's a full government planning process with public meetings, with extensive stakeholder input from various industries, from private citizens, <laughs> things of that nature. Uh, it's similar, it was similar in Australia. Uh, you know, I believe at the time it was the most comments the government of Australia had ever received on a regulatory matter, so that kind of extensive outreach was present there as well. In Europe it took a bit of a different form, and our sense is that this is just uh, fairly typical for most government processes in that region, which is that institutional stakeholders were offered the ability to comment on the plan once the government already had a solid draft together, um, and that those comments were taken into consideration before the final plan. Uh, and while there was significant input from those stakeholders, at least relative to what typically happens, I think the overall level relative to what we saw in the United States and Australia was significantly Great, thanks. We have a couple questions on offshore finfish aquaculture. Uh, did you encounter uh, examples of offshore finfish aquaculture emerging in these five plans? And what would be the likely economic value of offshore finfish aquaculture zones, in your opinion? Yep. Uh, so I can at least tackle the first part of that question, which is we did not see any examples of expanded finfish aquaculture from the ocean plans. Uh, they, what we did see was some prospective sense that aquaculture, be it finfish, uh, and in some cases shellfish, uh, could potentially be integrated with offshore wind farms in the future, but that was still in the uh, it's some combination of research and piloting stage, and since we were most interested in 
uh, what retrospective impacts we could look at. We did not look at it further. Uh, as far as what the economic impacts of those would be, uh, we just it, it was not a focus for our analysis. Okay, thanks. How were the concerns of Indian tribal regions, uh, this is in the U.S., uh, incorporated into state-level marine spatial planning? Are their overall goals different from other stakeholder groups in the process? Uh, interesting. So I can speak from the perspective of the plan, uh, which is that uh, in both Massachusetts and Rhode Island, tribes were consulted as part of the stakeholder process I don't remember uh, whether that was on a you know, sovereign to sovereign basis and government to government negotiation or whether it was included in the broader stakeholder piece of it. Like, my sense is that those processes went quite well. Uh, and I know in Rhode Island in particular, there are great examples of uh, not even a, a give and take, but a mutually beneficial research process in which uh, tribal elders were consulted as to what areas should be off limits for traditional cultural property reasons. And at the same time, uh, those tribes were able to provide you know, their sense of, of what should be protected and be a co-participant co in that plan development process. I believe also through a grant from the University of Rhode Island, there are tribal members uh, on research vessels doing some of the data collection that is needed for the plan. So. Our sense is that it was, it was quite strong in those states. Great, thanks. We have a question on Norway. Who undertook the moving shipping lane project uh, in Norway? Was it IMO or a Coast Guard equivalent? And if somebody wanted to learn more about that, uh, that plan, uh, where could they go for more information? Uh, sure. So the government of Norway, uh, the particular ministry actually changed names a year or two ago, but I believe uh, it's the transport ministry that's now in charge of it, um, but had collected, it was part of the data and, and planning effort for the, marine, for the ocean plan, saw that this was a possibility and put together the petition to the IMO that the IMO accepted. I, I'm not an expert on the IMO's workings to know how extensive the, the give and take there was. And but it, I believe at least it originated with the relevant ministry in Norway. Uh, as far as where to find more information on that, the, the IMO proceedings uh, decisions are online. Uh, if the questioner wants a particular context, I'm happy to, to provide those uh, through email. And again, uh, to the audience, Jason and Lee's email addresses are on the screen, um, and they, they welcome uh, hearing from you. Uh, if you uh, would like uh, contacts or links, uh, such as what Jason just described on Norway, or if you have um, questions about their, their research in general. Uh, how do you guys find the German plans? Uh, do you think they care? This is the question, do you think they care enough for environmental protection? Uh, do they focus more on economic aspects? Uh, good question. So we, we spent less time investigating the German plans as the others, so everything I'm about to say should be you know, taken with a, a grain or two of salt. Our impression of the German plan is that it's broadly consistent with other northern European ocean plans, which is to say uh, that there was a, a negligible uh, increase in environmental protection per se, right there. We didn't see any new marine protected areas or things like that. Uh, the focus was on economic development, but, but with, I, I think it's fair to say, a lens of managing it in a way that's sustainable in the long run. Uh, so, you know, whether that's modifying wind farm lease measures or trying to at least encourage wind development in areas of lesser uh, biological importance, you know, if those measures were in there, you know, relative to putting a third of the Great Barrier Reef into a no-take area, you know, that was not true. Yeah, so just to build off of that, what we saw is that the results of the plan um, were highly dependent on the specific context and the motivation for developing a plan in the first place. 
Um, so if you take the Great Barrier Reef Plan, you know, it was the, the motivation there was to protect the reef given its uh, economic and cultural and environmental importance in Australia. Um, and so the end plan you know, has considerable protections of the reef, including marine protected areas and no-take zones. Um, in Rhode Island, I think a large incentive to develop a plan was the desire to get offshore wind. Um, and that's, that's a part of the reason why Rhode Island's plan extended beyond the state water in, to cover the federal waters as well. Um, because they realized that was where most of the offshore wind was likely to take place. Um, <clears throat> and in Europe, the context has largely been different where the government has seen this as a way to uh, balance all of the competing interests to develop something that's sustainable for the long term from an economic perspective, uh, but also with some environmental benefits. And so the, the motivation behind the plans have been a significant driver of how those plans have turned out. That's great. Um, that that leads into another question that came up, um, which also deals with with the context of each plan. Did you guys define what environmental protection meant um, universally, or was this something that was defined by each plan, and you allowed each plan to kind of uh, take the lead on on um, addressing what that meant for, for each one. Yep. So just in the in the pure quantitative sense, when we get back to that figure of so an average of 50% under protection, we started with the IUCN categories for what a marine protected area uh, could include. And so that was those basic, <coughs> excuse me, strict and medium level of protections. So we, we held fast to those in a universal sense of what the IUCN would consider different level protection. You know, it did seem that a lot of the plans were doing something additional and similar between them, which is to restrict industrial development in parts of the ocean. So that was you know, a non-IUCN reference level, but it's still consistent across the plans, which is you know, if it's extremely unlikely that a wind farm, a liquidified natural gas terminal or something similar is going to be built in that ocean space, we categorize that as that final lighter level of protection. Excellent, thanks. And to the audience, uh, keep your questions coming in and in, in the control, the webinar control panel. Uh, this is great. We're, we're plowing through a lot here. And we still have over 15 minutes left, so thank you for sending in your questions. These are great. Uh, Jason and Lee, do you think the success of an ocean plan depends on a good planning process or more on the capacity of the state for implementing the plan? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, you know, we, we didn't specifically look at that question. You know, looking across the five plans, I think you'd have to say that both are really important. You know, what those look like in different uh, context varies, as Lee says, a lot of what you mean by success depends on what the relevant agency in government was trying to accomplish. Uh, I don't think we saw a major split between you know, what had come out of the plan process and then what was implemented, uh, but I think that speaks to the strength of those that undertook the plans and then enforcing them. Uh, it might be, you know, we did we did restrict our analysis to plans that have been implemented for a few years. You might get a different answer if you looked at plans you know, that had gone through a whole planning process, are fully complete, but are not yet implemented. Okay, thanks. I have an economic question, which gets at uh, tweezing the, uh, the economic impacts of, of ocean planning on, uh, on different user groups. Can you provide more detail about how you calculated the economic cost to fishermen of planning? Uh, the question goes on, the costs associated with the loss of areas to fish because of wind farms, for example, taking up space, makes sense, but wouldn't that be true regardless of planning? In other words, how did you separate the cost to fishermen of getting a wind farm sited with help from an ocean plan 
versus the cost they would have experienced had the wind farm been sited without a planning process. Do you guys understand that question? Yep. Yep. And so look, this is this is a difficult one because it's it's always hard to compare something that happened to something that's that's more hypothetical. So I'll I'll describe our methodology and why we chose to go that way. So the the short answer is is we for the purposes of this analysis, we thought it was most useful to discuss what happened due to the plan without particular reference to what would have happened in the absence of the plan. And the reason for that is that it's really hard to know, particularly in the United States, whether a major wind farm could be developed off Rhode Island without an ocean plan. Right? So in some ways, your baseline might just be you no know, wind farm. In other cases, you know, I think it it's, could just as easily be true that you know, certain industrial developments were going to happen anyway, and the ocean plan facilitated them and perhaps did not have as great of an impact on whether they happened or not. I think what you see regardless of those is that the fishermen quite rightly uh, see the development as at least in a sense coming out of the plan and have a stake in influencing the plan and making sure their interests are protected. And further, that the plans we saw on the whole took those considerations into account and provided compensation to the fishermen based on the notion that, you know, at least to some extent, they are negatively impacted by a new wind development and they deserve to be compensated. Yeah, so I, I guess just to build on that, um, what we tried to do was to look was to look at wind development that we could attribute to coming out of the planning process and to look exclusively as <coughs> at those examples um, as cases where we as cases where we would look at the loss to fisheries so not looking at other developments that took place either outside of the planning process um, or existed previously prior to the planning process um, it's it's very hard, though, to tease out what would have, as Jason was saying, to tease out what would have happened in the abstract. And so we compared to the status quo as to trying to come up with uh, a hypothetical business, you know, a hypothetical scenario of what would have happened without the plan. Thanks. Yeah, as, as one questioner um, mentioned here, it's it's conceivable that that BOEM uh, could have permitted wind, wind farming off of Nantucket and Rhode Island without um, an ocean planning process underway. Yeah, that that's exactly right, um, and that it's it's quite hard for us to control for that. Another economics question. In your analysis, did you take into account the multiplier effect of marine industries, that is, the economic impacts to fishing, wind energy, et cetera, but also the associated industries like fish processing, energy, transportation, restaurants, and businesses that benefit from increased wages in those industries? How far up the economic chain did you go? Uh, good question. We did not attempt to estimate the indirect economic benefits of these industries. Uh, partially because methodologically you know, there are very different ways of calculating those indirect impacts and so there, there's not a whole lot that you could cross compare between different studies. Uh, also we really just wanted to keep the analysis to be as, as grounded as possible in the direct impacts of ocean planning. You know, I think someone could take this data and then you know, spin out those, those broader impacts but that was not a goal of ours. Okay, thanks. Uh, a comment and question here. Uh, there is a general consensus in the U.S. that industry has not been as involved at the table in marine planning as hoped. And that I think the suggestion there is that's uh, on the prerogative of industry rather than uh, planners not wanting industry to be involved. Uh, did you find this to be the case in the five case studies uh, in your in your report, understanding that these are both inside and outside the U.S. Basically, how how yes, interested has industry been uh, in being involved in in each of those five projects? 
Yeah, so I would distinguish. What well, one thing that was interesting to us is distinguishing between different industries. Um, so, for example, if you take the fishing industry, which was quite concerned about potential losses as a result of new development, uh, they were quite interested and they were involved. They're also, in most cases, um, there's, they're organized and had representatives. It's a bit trickier for some of the developing industries. Um, so wind, for example, where uh, it's, you know, it's much bigger companies, there are fewer of them, they're less organized in a consistent way. Um, and so what we saw was that there were, in the, that there were, was industry interested in tracking the results of the plan, but there was less opportunity, um, I'd say, in Massachusetts and Rhode Island uh, for the wind industry to be directly involved. Um, and I think that gets at one of the distinctions between the incumbent users where they clearly have a stake in it and the potential users where they don't yet have uh, they don't yet have that seat at the table. Jason, you add to that? Yeah, that's a good point. I'd say there there is another this is another one of those questions where the answer varies greatly based on geography. Uh, we heard from multiple people both within government and non fishing industry in Europe that the basic philosophy was that the government's job is to produce something that's in the best interest of the entire country and that you know, particular industries could comment on it, but they were much less interested in what they had to say. And I think the U.S. system is generally more deferential and interested in what those particular industrial stakeholders have to say about the plan. All right, thanks, guys. How can assessments and monitoring keep pace with the highly iterative nature of marine planning processes? How would you expand and continue uh, this assessment that you've done uh, on, on, uh, on marine planning? Good question. It, it sounds like there's two different things going on in that question. I'll, I'll try to take a stab pull. So one is, you know, given that the plans are designed to be iterative and, and adaptive as things change. You know, how can you consistently keep track of what's going on? And second is, you know, given all that, what would you do to evaluate their impacts? On the first, you know, I think we did see some examples of strong data collection from the start, or at least near the start. Uh, it gets back to Lee's point that to the extent you can define your objective ahead of time, that gives you a sense of what you would like to monitor. Uh, so. You know, just for example, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority has a uh, reasonably consistent set of indicators they are looking at on a rolling five-year basis or so uh, that keeps track of things. You know, they believe you know, they do change a bit, they add, they subtract as, as needed, but at least there's a, there's a solid base of data that allows you to move forward by measuring the things you think you're going to care about. Uh, as far as ongoing analysis, you know, I think, you know, sitting here in 2014, you know, there were only, you know, really five to ten plans that had been in place for a few years. I think over the coming years, when we see a lot more coming online, there will be greater opportunities to look across plans and to draw more generalized lessons. Great, thanks. Uh, did you guys find any negative social impacts in addition to the positive impacts that are listed um, in your presentation? It's a good question. I, I'm just trying to, to think a bit on what a negative social impact would look like. I, here's what I'll say is, you know, I certainly to the extent there were perceptions that this kind of plan could be harmful to people, you know, I think there was a lot of uh, you know, people were disconcerted about it. And the, the best example I can think of is in the Great Barrier Reef, where prior to the zoning plan, you know, a, lar a much larger percent of the reef was open to fishing. And so when the plan comes out and says, you know, look, preservation of these heritage values is actually more important to us than you know, the economic benefits of fishing in this case, that did result in a significant backlash against the plan. Uh, you know, that said, 
over the long run what we've seen, and there, there are a few, we cite a few papers on this in, in our work, and I'd be happy to, to send those along, is that the more the authorities reached out to fishermen on the, on the plan itself, both in the planning process and then on an ongoing basis, the more and more those, that initial uh, uncertainty and disruption has, has dissipated. Yeah, I guess to add to that, it, I think it depends a lot on how well a plan is done. So, for example, um, what we saw in both Massachusetts and Rhode Island was an improvement in the relationship between the fishing industry um, and the government, where the fishing industry uh, provided data on places that were important, and those got incorporated into the plan. If, if the planning process was not done well, though, and they provided that data, which, you know, they are very sensitive about their fishing data. Rightly so. Um, and it was not then incorporated into the planning, you know, that, that could be detrimental to the relationship between the fishing industry and government. Um, so I, I think it's, it is dependent on the plans being, that having a planning process that's done well and where their input is reflected in the ultimate result of the plan. All right, uh, we have another question on the social side. Did you consider social benefits to communities from a coastal regeneration perspective? Uh, for example, overall job growth, uh, community well-being, heritage. Yep. So <laughs> this uh, it's a great question, and you know it's it's one of those areas that we think is a, a promising future direction uh, for some research. But we did not have strong data linking the ocean plans, which generally started you know, a few nautical miles offshore, to particular coastal communities. Um, you know, as Lee said, on the environmental side, right, it would be really nice if you could talk not just about you know, what percent of the ocean is protected, but on what the impact on the ecology is. I think it's a similar point on the economics of coastal communities. So unfortunately, we were not able to do a lot of work there. Okay. Uh, a question on tourism. It seemed that your results suggested that there was no increase, but also no decrease in tourism as a result of the plans you studied. Is this true for all your five case studies? Uh, broadly speaking, yes, insofar as the question is, you know, did the ocean plan result, you know, in in a plausible connection to greater or less tourism. Um, you know, different plans, I think, you know, manage tourism in different ways that was helpful. Um, you know, so just for example, in Rhode Island, part of the plan was an economic analysis of the benefits of the sailing industry, and that's useful to the sailing industry. It's not, it, it's not clearly empirically able to be tied to then what the ocean plan provided um, in the Great Barrier Reef, where, which is by far the largest tourism industry of the plans we, we described. Uh, I think the real risk there was that greater development would have, impact, would have negatively impacted tourism values because of the plan they did not. Uh, since then, you know, tourism has gone up and down with economic cycles, the value of the Australian dollar, typhoon season, things like that. Um, so we, we couldn't, we did not feel comfortable just saying, okay, because tourism is more valuable now or less valuable now than it was then, you know, that's due to the ocean plan. Okay, thanks you guys. All right, we're, we're coming up on the end of the hour. Uh, I think we have time for perhaps one, one or, well, probably one more question, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, this gets at relative values of, of, um, of various uh, uses of the ocean. Is it possible that citizens would value access to healthy local seafood more than the relative dollar value compared to other uses of the ocean? And if so, is this approach, if, is your approach in this Redstone study fully inclusive of how society thinks about resources? Um, you know, in other words, would people rank 
access to local seafood much more than other industrial uses of the ocean. How can you account for those preferences? Yeah, look, I, I think that's a great question. Um, it's not one we were able to directly assess, so we did not you know, do polling of, of consumer and coastal communities on you know, what values were most important to them, although many of the plans did similar outreach efforts where they, they did ask people what, where their values lie. Um, our, our study was mostly focused on what we had seen as a direct result of the ocean plants. So we weren't able to take that head on. Uh, I do think it's an interesting question uh, and could influence how planners think about the way they want to allocate space and resources between industries. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's one more factor that would be taken into account with other multiplier effects. So, for example, when you look at the fishing industry, what's the value of that fishing industry, but then what's also, what are the multipliers to the community of having the industry, what's the value of having local seafood. Um, I, I think it's a great question and it's part of that larger set of questions that would be quite interesting to explore. That's great. Yeah, I think that's a nice point to, to end up, uh, to end this with. Um, so again, we're, we're up with our hour. Um, thank you very much, Jason and Lee, for, for providing this preview of, of the results from your research. As, as we cover at the beginning of the Q&A, um, you plan on publishing uh, your results uh, in a journal uh, in the coming months. Um, the newsletter, Marine Ecosystems and Management, will be uh, uh, covering uh, we'll be uh, providing an additional preview of some of your results in our upcoming issue. I look forward to, to working with you on that. Um, and the recording of this webinar will be available on open channels for anyone uh, who wants to re-listen to it or did not get a chance to join the webinar today, be able to, uh, to do that. So we look forward to getting the word out about this, this great study. Um, do you have Do you have anything to add, Jason and Lee? Uh, no, just uh, really appreciate everyone that made this happen and was able to join us this morning. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, I thank you very much to the audience for all the questions. I apologize we didn't have a chance to get to all your questions and comments, but uh, very much appreciated um, your your participation and and uh, and um, uh, that was that was great. Uh, so uh, with that, um, we'll, we are wrapping up this webinar. Uh, please use the question box to uh, contribute any additional comments. We'll leave that open Actually, for a minute no, or two. Actually, we'll not leave it open. We'll, once the webinar ends, um, everything closes out. Okay. Sorry That's the voice that. of Nick Weiner, <laughs> Open Channels Project Manager. <laughs> we will not be leaving the question box open, but um, if you have any uh, comments, you can send them to info at openchannels.org. Is that okay, Nick? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Or you can also reply back to the uh, register, or webinar registration link. Uh, that'll go to my email. Awesome. All right. Thank all you right. all for coming. Yep. Thank you, Jason and Lee. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to Sarah Carr of the EBM Tools Network, uh, co-host of this uh, webinar. And uh, we hope you all have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everybody.